Well, congratulations. You have made it to the final class in, in this safety class. That final chapter, there we go. Final chapter in this safety class. One more review next week and you'll be ready to test. Tonight we're covering safety and hopefully we won't be doing it as quick as we did last night. We're gonna start off with electrical hazards. Voltage is potential, current is a snake that will bite you. Trust me. Uh, large currents can burn the skin, heat tissue, and disrupt the normal electrical flow of the body. That is a test question. Okay. Electrical safety. Don't work on live equipment unless absolutely necessary. Well, we know that that's not always feasible. Sometimes you have to work on live equipment. If you have to work on live equipment, don't do it alone. Make sure there's someone else there, someone that can respond or pick up the phone and dial 911 while you're glowing like a light bulb. Never assume equipment is off or de-energized. Uh, more people get shocked by equipment that did not have any power on them than any other equipment. Always check your equipment with a meter first. Or if you've got a younger brother, here, give me your finger. Yeah. Uh, if you're working on feed lines or antennas, be sure that uh, a transmitter or amplifier cannot be activated while you're doing it. You don't want to be on the receiving end of either the, the voltage and current coming through or the RF going, woo -woo -woo, making your hair stand up. Keep one hand in your pocket while probing or testing energized equipment. This is a very good piece of advice that is never ever followed. <laughs> um, I have seen some people that will take their hand and put it behind their back. But the reason that you, you don't want to use two hands is you don't, if you get shocked, you do not want to complete that current going across your heart. Wear shoes with an insulated sole. Uh, that is imperative. Also, if you've got the rubber work mats, those not only will help take a little bit of strain off your back and your feet, they also provide you some insulation from, from the floor. Remove all unnecessary jewelry. That's another one that's not followed as much as what it should be. If you get shocked, that ring or that chain that you've got around your neck will conduct electricity quickly. I've responded to many emergency with EMS and seeing the individuals lose their fingers because of wearing a ring. Another reason that you want to remove them is even if you're not dealing with uh, a device where you're working inside, if you're out working on an antenna, if you get into a heavy RF field, that ring and that chain is going to conduct heat and it'll get hot. Always remember safety first. If you're working on a device, especially something like an amplifier, something that contains capacitors, remember capacitors can store a charge after the charging circuit has been disconnected. I always test or discharge them by testing with a meter and or a grounding stick to short them to ground. That is also a test question. Battery basics, batteries can heat leak or spark if the terminal posts are shorted out. So if you drop a wrench across them, you can short that thing out. It can lead to burns, fire, the battery can explode. Make sure that you keep all metal objects away from the battery and especially not near a shelf that where it can fall on top of the battery. Also batteries can produce unwanted gases while you're charging them. So make sure that you do so in, in a well ventilated area and away from combustible material. 
Wiring and safety grounding. NEC, the National Electric Code, is the Bible when it comes to electricity. It contains detailed information about household wiring, wiring in your ham shack, about anything that's non-electronics that you, you want to know about electricity, you can find in the NEC. They are the national governing body, but your key area to go to for information and the people that are going to be able to slap you on the wrist are going to be your local authority. Whoever the local municipality is, if you're in a city or county, so you need to follow their codes and rules. They normally coincide pretty, pretty well with the NEC, but sometimes they can veer away just a little bit. But I'll also remember that because you, you'll see that again also. The, the, the general per, uh, agency that you follow is your local codes, local codes enforcement. And if you're in doubt, have a licensed electrician do the work for you or see if they'll just check it when you're done. Wiring safety and grounding. Okay, these are the standard wire color conventions that, that are acknowledged. Uh, this is not by no means written in stone. However, you will see this again on the test, so you need to know it as it's presented here. A hot wire is black or red, and they connect to a brass or terminal screw on a receptacle. The neutral wire is white, and it connects to a silver terminal screw on a receptacle. Your ground wire is green, has green insulation, or is bare, and it'll connect to a bare copper terminal or screw on the receptacle. Okay, that's for the test. Depending on who wired your house, <laughs> yeah, trust me, especially if you've got a switch leg. If you've got a switch that turns a receptacle on or off, and the only thing that's pulled that, to that switch from that receptacle is a switch leg, the black and the white will both be hot. So guess what? Even if you know the way it's supposed to be wired, check it with a meter before you play with it. Wiring safety and grounding. Uh, if a, the equipment has a metal chassis, you want to make sure that it's grounded to whatever grounding wire you've got coming to that device. Um, that will definitely keep high voltage off of your, your chassis so it won't shock you if you, you touch it. Um, excuse me. <clears throat> and always try to use three wire AC cords. Uh, most of the things that you see today, most cords are going to be a, th a three wire. Uh, that would be uh, your, your two conductors and a ground. Uh, I've been guilty of this too. Uh, don't take a cord from a radio that is a two wire cord and or that's a three wire cord excuse me and have a, an extension cord that's a two wire cord and look at it and go I can't plug it together I'm going to take side cutters and break the ground off that's a no no use three wire cords when, I, when whenever it's possible Wiring and safety grounding. Use cable and wire sufficiently rated for the expected load. Uh, of course, you know the current rating is going to be in amps. The two most common sizes for household wiring are number 12 for 20 amp circuits and number 14 for 15 amp circuits. So you'll see that again also. And always make sure that whatever type of safety device, be it a fuse or a circuit breaker, coincides with the wire that you've got run. And protective components. Fuses and circuit breakers prevent equipment damage and fire by removing voltage when there's a current overload, eventually. The way fuses work, all of you know by looking at a little round glass fuse, it's got a little metal strip in it. As the current goes through, that strip heats up. When it gets too hot, it breaks, and that's how it, how it stops the, the flow. Uh, breakers ha are, have a bimetallic material inside, and it'll heat and cause it to bend. 
And as it does, it will mechanically trip and, and throw the circuit where there's, it's no longer energized. Make sure that uh, a fuse or, or the breaker is located on the hot wire. Never put them on a neutral wire. Open and neutral does not remove voltage from whatever circuit you're working on. Shock prevention, safety interlocks, a lot of amplifiers and some radios. Well, I guess any equipment could be equi equipped with them, but uh, safety interlocks are little switches that if you open the case up, it will open the switch and de-energize, theoretically de-energize the whatever you're working on. However, if you pop it off, it does have a safety switch. There's no juice coming in. That does not mean you don't have juice within inside that box. You've got capacitors in there that can be storing up electricity. And if you don't think a capacitor will bite you, you are way mistaken. Trust me. Uh, we used to charge those things up and new guys come in the, the, the shop and we'd just toss it to them, let them catch it, and they'll remember it. Never bypass an interlock switch during testing unless specifically instructed to do so, and then follow the instructions. A GFCI, it'll trip when an imbalance is sensed between the hot and the neutral wires. These things are a lot more sensitive than a, a circuit breaker or a fuse. They are so sensitive that just a few milliamps of imbalance and they will shut down, they'll pop. And that's well below the threshold of injury. These GFCI breakers are located anywhere where you've got uh, moisture or where there's direct contact with uh, earth with the earth so you should have these already in your house uh, especially if it's been had any kind of work done since what 1970 um, GFCIs are required in bathrooms and in kitchens especially within six feet from the sink the length of a power cord and also for any receptacles located on the outside these things are very sensitive and they will save your equipment but m more more so they will save you lightning lightning protection that you can provide for your station will prevent fires and reduce damage to your equipment the best lightning protection is to disconnect everything <laughs> um, that is not done very very frequently it can be very laborious and not a fun experience. So most people opt for another type of lightning protection uh, for their feed lines coming into the house. But remember that the, the, the safest way is to just dis disconnect it and disconnect all the power cables to your radios and amplifiers also. Grounding wires and straps should be as short and as direct as possible. Uh, you don't want to have to be running a ground halfway through your house. If you can get it out into to a ground rod, the shortest and the straightest way possible is, is the best. Lightning d does not like to make sharp bends and turns. So if you've got a 90 degree turn in it, it's probably going to shoot out the wire, find the next available quickest route to ground. So. It can cause a, a, a lot of damage. It's like a bull in a china shop. All towers, mast, and antenna mounts should be grounded. If you're talking about a tower, each leg should be grounded with eight foot ground rod. And then all of the rods should be bonded together. Lightning grounds must be bonded together and as well as other safety grounds and earth connections. Use mechanical cl uh, clamps, brazing, or welding to make sure that there, there's a mechanical connection. If you try to use solder, solder is going to deteriorate over time. Uh, if lightning hits it, your solder is vaporized. It's going to be gone. Solder joint, well, just like I said there, it may be destroyed in the heat of lightning. We've got some rain. 
Okay, where cables and feed lines enter your structure using lightning arresters grounded to a common plate that is connected to an external ground. This is your best means other than disconnecting everything and getting it out of your house is to use lightning arresters. But always remember, they go, they're grounded to a common plate which is then connected to an external ground. That's the test question, you'll see it again. And here we go. Which of the following is a safety hazard of a 12 volt storage battery? Shorting the terminals can cause burns, fire, or an explosion. What health hazard is presented by electrical current flowing through a body? Correct. It can cause injury by heating the tissue, it can disrupt the electrical functions of the cells, and it can cause involuntary uh, muscle contra contractions. In the United States, what is connected to the green wire in a three-wire electrical plug? The equipment ground. What is a good way to guard against electrical shock at your station? Yes, use three wire cords and plugs for all AC powered equipment, connect all AC powered station equipment to a common safety ground, and use a circuit protected by ground fault interrupter. Which of these precautions should be taken when installing devices or lightning protection in a coaxial cable feed line? D, mount all the protectors on a metal plate that is in turn connected to an external ground rod. What safety equipment should always be included in home built equipment that is powered from 120 volt AC power circuits? A, a fuse or circuit breaker in series or the hot. What should be done to all external ground rods or earth connections? Correct, bond them together with a heavy wire or conductive strap. What kind of hazard might exist in a power supply when it's turned off and disconnected? D, D you might receive an electrical shock from charged storage and large capacitors. Which of the following is true concerning grounding conductors used for lightning protection? Sharp bends must be avoided. Which of the following establishes grounding requirements for an amateur radio tower or an antenna? B, your local electrical codes. Which of the following is good practice when installing ground wires on a tower for lightning protection? C. Correct. All ground should be short and direct. All right, managing RF in your station. This is new for me because this is the first time they've actually included this in a technician class. RF from your transmitting, transmitting antenna can leach into your electrical wiring and electronics. This is also known as common mode. You, you want to keep the RF where you want it and away from where you don't. Oh, RF grounding, it's not the same as AC safety grounding. Uh, and a better term for it would be bonding. You want to keep, you, you're not wanting to get the level of voltage to zero. Uh, if you actually grounded it, you would be disrupting the whole purpose. How does RF travel on your wires? In a, in a common coax wire, feed wire, how many conductors are conducting RF energy? There's three. 
center conductor, the inside of your, your uh, shield, and the outside of your shield. So if you ground it, where's your RF going? It's not going to be coming where you want it anymore. Therefore, you want to try to get a established voltage across all of your devices. That will actually keep RF from entering where you don't want it. Current won't flow between two pieces of equipment and cause RF feedback if you can get that voltage constant across all your devices. RF and a, uh, feedback in a microphone can cause a real distorted transmitted audio sound. And you, you'll, you'll know it if you ever hear it. And you, you, hopefully you'll know it if you see it again in a few minutes because that's on the test. Uh, by keeping that, that voltage constant and by bonding all of your equipment together, it'll minif minimize the RF hotspots, which can cause RF burns also. The best way to use to bond your equipment together is by using a flat strap, a solid flap, stra uh, flat strap. I'll get it out in a minute. And I'm going to show you a, a design on how to how to bond your equipment in in your shack here in a moment. This right here is a good example of a good flat copper strap to use for bonding. Uh, that can be ordered through Georgia Copper. Gary is a big uh, fan of Georgia Copper. And to connect your devices to this common conductor, you can use uh, braided straps uh, or that's, that's the preferred method, method. If you look here, all of your devices are bonded straight to that solid strap. And that strap goes to oh, a, heavy, a heavy strap or line that goes out to your ground rod. Well, why don't we take all of these and just connect them to the ground rod? If you were to do that, you've got to remember the radio, the power supply, and all your accessories and your computer are all tied together. So if you were to run them straight out, you'd be creating loops in between. And that would be bad juju. But always remember, using that flat strap is the best mode of bonding. All right. Which of the following conductors provides the lowest impedance to, an, to RF signals? You better not get that wrong. That's going to be D, a flat strap. What is the symptom of RF feedback in a transmitter or transceiver? C. C, reports of garbled, distorted, or unintelligible voice transmissions. RF interference. There are two types of RF interference. Interference from your transmitter to other devices or equipment, and interference to your receiver from other devices or equipment. And I, I found that little diagram or whatever you want to call it and, and included it here, but it really has little meaning. I just thought it looked cool. Ferrite chokes. Ferrite chokes are your friend. Uh, I've got a bunch of them. Gary's got oodlins, oodlins on them. Uh, basically, you can use those uh, on to shield audio, microphone, and c computer cables, and to block common mode RF current currents on whatever line you're using. Other ways to help keep down RFI are filters. Uh, bad thing about filters is you need to know exactly what is causing your interference in order to make sure you've got the right filter. Why? Because filters will shut out RF. So you might be getting rid of the interference, but you may be getting rid of what you're wanting to utilize also. Because filters attenuate signals. High pass uh, filters 
are used to reduce low frequency signals. So we use those to eliminate HF on TVs. Uh, low pass filters are used to reduce high frequency signals and we mainly use those for telephones. You plug it right into your jack and plug your telephone into to the filter. Band pass filters will only pass a range of signals and notch filters will narrow, it reduces a narrow range of signals. Remember that band, and re band reject and notch filters will reduce the VHF and UHF on TVs. That will also, you'll see that again. RFI for, from your transmission. The most common causes of RFI that, that we instigate is fundamental overload, harmonics, and spurious emissions. Well, let's talk about fundamental overload for just a minute. If you are getting if you have a TV or an AM or FM radio and there is a very strong close signal nearby, these components that, are, that make up the TV or radio, they can be overloaded. They can just be overpowered and overwhelmed. And it can, create, it can cause them to pick up signals outside of the frequency that they're, they're designed to, to copy. And it, you'll get... If you ever have it, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. But fundamental overload is the most common. Number one cause for uh, TV, TV interference is going to be leakage. And the main, main cause of leakage is bad connectors. And that can be from the connectors going to the TV, and that can also be bad connectors in your radio. That can go both ways. RFI guidelines. Operate your equipment properly. And always make sure that you've got your everything under control inside your shack before branching out to other alternatives. Eliminate the interference in your own home. Uh, use good station building practices to eliminate unwanted signals. And to do that, use shielded wire and cables, shielded equipment, and good connections and filters. If you have a problem anywhere, your first step should always be check your connections. Why do we use shielded wire and shielded cables? Shielded wire and cables prevent coupling with unwanted signals and undesired radiation. And you will see that again. That's why it's in the slide all by itself. Okay, what happens if you've got neighbors interfering with you? And I don't mean he's throwing leaves over in your yard. I'm, I mean, <laughs> the first thing you need to do is make sure that you have good practices. Check your own equipment first. If your neighbor's complaining that you're interfering with their TV, check and make sure, check your TV and make sure you're not interfering with your TV. It could be their problem and not yours. Yeah, but with digital today, it shouldn't be a problem anyway, right? That was only analog, wasn't it? It can still be a problem. RF is yeah. RF. RF is RF. Uh, if there is a problem, always offer to, to help them investigate. Once you've ruled it out being your problem and in your place, offer to help them. And always be polite about it. If it still doesn't work out, then you can always pol politely play the ace card. Part 15. The FCC wrote Part 15 that covers unlicensed electronic devices, and that can be everything from Wi-Fi remotes to remote power switches, remote controls, garage door openers, baby monitors. It, it covers a whole host of things, and it's by no means limited to just those. And they can be the cause of interference that you have on, in your shack. Uh, if that's the case, then 
you need to find out what it is and where it's coming from. Now, although we don't want it, you don't want interference either way, but you can also be interfering with those devices. You key up your mic and your neighbor's garage door opens up. You know, it's actually his problem because you're a licensed station. His garage door is not. But if you don't want to find extra dog poop on your yard next, the next morning, you want to try to play nice with your neighbors. But that's all be, the, the part 15 says is try to, try to be cordial, but in the end, you're a licensed operating station. All of these unlicensed things are not, so they have to comply. Questions? Which of the following could you use to cure distorted audio caused by RF current on the shield of a microphone cable? Ferrite choke. Ferrite choke. Which of the following is a common reason to use shielded wire? Correct. To, to prevent coupling of unwanted signals to or from the wire. What would cause a broadcast AM or FM radio to receive an amateur radio transmission unintentionally? It's worded a little different, but we did cover that. A, the receiver is unable to reject strong signals outside the AM or FM band. Which of the following can cause radio frequency interference? All, all. all of the above. Fundamental overload, harmonics, or spurious emissions. Which of the following can cause radio frequency interference? Oh. <laughs> You're correct. It didn't change. Which of the following is a way to reduce or eliminate interference from an amateur transmitter to a nearby telephone? Put an RF filter on the telephone. How can overload of a non-amateur radio or TV receiver by an amateur signal be reduced or eliminated? <laughs> Block the amateur signal with a filter at the antenna input of the affected receiver. Don't you just love how they word these things? It just <laughs> Which of the following actions should, take, should you take if a neighbor tells you that your station's transmissions are interfering with their radio or TV reception? Break out the potato gun. A. A. Make sure that your station is functioning properly and that it does not cause interference to your own radio or t TV when it is turned to the same channel. Which of the following can reduce overload to a VHF transceiver from a nearby FM broadcast station? Now, D, correct. The key here is we're talking about a VHF receiver from a nearby FM broadcast station. So a band reject filter would take care of that. What should you do if something in the neighbor's home is causing harmful interference to your amateur station? D. All of these are correct. Work with your neighbor to identify the offending device. Politely inform your neighbor about the rules that prohibit the use of devices that cause interference. Check your station to make sure that it meets the standards of, a good, of good amateur practice. What is a part 15 device? A. a, an unlicensed device that may emit low powered radio signals on frequencies used by licensed service. What should be the first step to resolve cable TV interference from your ham radio transmission? Correct. 
If there's a problem, always check your connectors first. Be sure all TV coaxial connectors are installed properly. RF exposure, anybody want a suntan? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay. RF is non-ionizing radiation. There is not enough power there to create genet genetic mutations in the body. That's the key difference between ionizing and non-ionizing radiation. The only way that non-ionizing non -ionizing radiation can cause injury is by heating. RF safety techniques. Reduce exposure to high strength fields. Well, hello. My dad always told me don't play marbles in the highway. That was his, his tip for me all the time. So how do we do that? We prevent access, gates, fences, prevent access to your antenna. Another way is don't create strong fields where people can, could be present. And ways to avoid that would be point your antenna away from where people might be or decrease your power. RF heating. Frequency and power causes excessive energy to be absorbed. This absorption occurs due to RF energy causing the molecules to vibrate at that same frequency. And that leads up to this, the specific absorption rate. The spe specific absorption rate measures the rate at which RF energy is absorbed by the human body. Uh, why is why are we pointing toward that? Because absorption varies with the frequency because the body absorbs more RF energy at certain frequencies than it does at others. And you will see that again. RF burns. Touching, you can get RF burns by touching or coming close to a conductive material that is con carrying high RF voltage. How do we prevent it? Don't touch it. Use proper bonding techniques and prevent access to those antennas. Maximum permissible exposure. How much can you be exposed to? Well, that depends on the power density levels. And basically all that is, is that's the intensity of the RF field. And that's measured in milliwatts per centimeter square. Right here, if you can see, I'm hoping that's clear enough for you to see it very well. This right here shows the maximum permissible exposure levels that are allowed. If you'll notice right here, there's, there's two things I want to point out. There's a big drop right here between 30 and 300 megahertz. That is where your lowest maximum permissible exposure levels are. And also, if you look over here at about, eh, that's somewhere in the 80 meter band, about three megahertz, that is where the, the highest maximum amount of exposure, permissible exposure is allowed. You'll see here that there's two different lines. There's a solid line. That solid line is a controlled area. The broken line is an uncontrolled area. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about those two in just a moment. This is just a written form of the, the diagram I just showed you. Uh, if you'll notice here, between, 300, between 30 and 300 megahertz it is your lowest at one, one milliwatt per centimeter squared, and even the same in the uncontrolled. Between, in the 30 to 300 megahertz range is 0.2 milliwatts per centimeter squared. We also have to know the duty cycle. The duty cycle is basically the radio, it, it tells how long the transmitter is transmitting during transmission. <laughs> um, during normal conversation, uh, it's considered that you're gonna be talking half, half the time and listening half the time. 
so that would equate to a 50% duty cycle, half on, half off. <coughs> FCC rules state that all stations perform an exposure evaluation. The most common evaluation uses techniques outlined in, wait for it, the FCC OET Bulletin 65. Guess what? You'll see that again. Uh, that OET stands for Office of Engineering Technology. Is that right? That's right. Here you can see the thresholds, the power thresholds for RF exposure evaluation. This is what it breaks down to. If you fall within these parameters, then you don't have to worry about the evaluation. So if you're operating, if your antenna will only operate on, I don't know, 40 meters, and that's what you're planning on working, and you're only, plan you're only running 100 watts, 500 watts is what's allowed on the 40 meter band. So you're well below that threshold. So you're good to go without performing an evaluation. One thing to look at here is if you'll notice the maximum power allowed for VHF transmissions, which would be the 6, 2, and 1.25 meter range before requiring an evaluation is 50 watts at peak envelope power at the antenna. So right here, that coincides with that dip in the bottom of the diagram I showed you previously. If you need an evaluation, the FCC OET Bulletin 65 can be used, online calculators, pre-calculated tables, field measuring equipment, and a calibrated antenna. If you're gonna to have to do an evaluation, things that you're gonna need are your RF signals frequency and power level, the distance from the antenna, and the antenna radiation pattern. So you're saying all these people on six meters, or they have to do an evaluation if it's over 50 watts? Correct. Well, there are a couple other things that are included in that, and I'm glad you brought that up. I didn't cover it mainly because it, it's, it's not on the test. You're not required to know it. Uh, but uh, you, when you're calculating that, you also have to calculate your feed line loss. So if it depends on where that antenna is located and what their feed line is made out of. But you are correct. If you have over 50 watts at the antenna, coming out of the antenna, over 50 watts, you have, on six meters, you have to do an evaluation. Do they ever come and audit that? They can. They can knock on your door and come in and look at everything you've got. Right. It does, it rarely happens, or I say rarely, I don't know anybody that they've showed up at their house. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so. The only thing I'm saying is it sounds, it sounds incredible. I mean, 50 watts. Well, if you think about it, you're, you, if you're using a mobile, what does your mobile put out? Most of them, 25 watts. Some of them you can find that'll produce 50 watts, but most of them are, are 25 watts. So your VHF, which would be your 6, 2, and 1.25, are going to fall underneath that unless you're carrying around this big amp in your car. And some people do, but they don't carry that amp for normally VHF, they're operating on HF frequencies. If you have to do a station evaluation, you must reevaluate, well, you must have to, you must reevaluate your RF exposure from your station if you change to a higher power, you increase your antenna gain, or you change your antenna height. All of those will contribute to um, your exposure. You don't need to reevaluate your exposure if you're already in compliance and you decrease your power. You can prevent exposure to RF radiation in excess of the FCC supplied limits by 
relocating your antenna. That is a test question. You can also prevent it by turning your antenna away from your neighbors so that they're not being exposed. You can also raise your antenna. You can turn down your power. There are many ways that you can do it, but this one is the one that's on the test. What, relocating your antenna? Relocating your antenna. How can you make sure your station stays in compliance with RF safety regula regulations? B, by reevaluating the station whenever an item or equipment has changed. Which of the following is an acceptable method to determine that your station complies with FCC RF exposure regulations? D, calculations based on Bulletin 65, by calculation based on computer modeling, or by using calibrated equipment and a fill strength meter. What factors affect the RF exposure of people near an amateur radio station antenna? All of the above, correct. Frequency and power level of the RF field, the distance from the antenna to the person, and the radiation pattern of that antenna. You can change any of those and decrease. What type, of your radiation, what type of radiation are VHF and UHF radio signals? First slide. D. D, non-ionizing radiation. <laughs> what is the maximum power level that an amateur radio station may use at VHF frequencies before an RF exposure evaluation is required? C. That would be C. Remember, we went over that. 50 watts peak envelope power at the antenna. Which of the following actions my amateur operators take to prevent exposure to RF radiation in excess of the FCC supplied limits? Lawyer question. A, relocate your antenna. Which of the following frequencies has the lowest value for maximum permissible exposure limit? Okay. That's the best question there. Remember, it's 30 megahertz to 300 megahertz. So yes, B, 50 megahertz. Why do exposure limits vary with frequency? D. D, the human body absorbs more RF energy at some frequencies than at others. What could happen if a person accidentally touched your antenna while you're transmitting? B, you might get a burn. Why is duty cycle one of the factors used to determine safe RF radiation exposure levels? A, it affects the average exposure of people to radiation. What is the definition of duty cycle during the averaging time for RF exposure? C. The percentage of time that your transmitter is transmitting. <laughs> How does RF radiation differ from ionizing radiation? A. RF radiation does not have the sufficient energy to cause genetic damage or mutations. If the averaging time for exposure is six minutes, which we quickly went over that. That was in, in the slide, but I didn't talk about it. If the averaging time for exposure is six minutes, how much power density is permitted if the signal is present for three minutes and absent for three minutes rather than being present for the entire six minutes? It's only being used half, so two times as much. In your, you're right, lawyers wrote this. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So if, if you're measuring for six minutes and it's on and off for three. Okay. Do I, I'm not, uh, okay, you got it? Yeah. Okay. Okay. 
All right, we're almost done. Mechanical safety. The most important rule for installing antennas, place all antennas and feed lines well clear of power lines. Why? <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Electricity can be bad juju. And you also do not want to mount your antenna on top of the power pole. Safety rules dictate that no part of your antenna system should be closer than 10 feet from power lines. We use a rule of thumb that says 150% of the height of your antenna or the tallest peak of your tower. Well, the tallest part, okay, uh, away from a distance. So if you're, you've got the, the top of your antenna on your tower is 40 feet in the air, if you calculate 150% of that 40 feet, it's going to be 60 feet, right? Everybody follow me? That 40 feet plus another half of that is going to be 20 feet. Added to the 40 feet would be 60 feet. You want it located that far away from power lines. Towers, mass, and hardware. Building permits are generally, generally required for crank up and tilt over towers. I don't know many hams that pull building permits. <laughs> I didn't say that out loud. Uh, but it's your responsibility to comply with your local codes. Trust me, they'll get in your wallet if you don't. Towers should be grounded with separate eight foot ground rods for each leg. And then those ground rods should be bonded together and bonded to an external ground. Also, if you happen to be near an airport, you may have to not just comply with the FCC, but you may have to deal with the FAA on top of that. Use safety wire through any turnbuckles used to guy to prevent them from loosening due to vibration and twisting. That is also a test question. Um, it's worded a little odd, but uh, basically, <laughs> exactly. Basically, that turnbuckle that you use to adjust the guy, you run a safety wire through it so that the, it can't turn. Okay. If you're having to do antenna and tower maintenance, turn off the transmitter and disconnect the feed line before you get started. That way, nobody can activate the radio, the transmitter, or the amplifier and Say welcome to the jungle. Climbers and ground crew must wear proper safety equipment, which is going to be hard hat, goggles, gloves, harness, belt, boots. Sunblock. Because if you're if you have to climb a 120 foot tower, are you going to want to have to go to the bathroom while you're up there? No. If you're up there, do you want to be exposed to that sun all the time? No. You want to protect yourself. So put on sunscreen and wear a diaper. The sunblock isn't a test question. The sunblock is the test question. No, it's actually not. But um, Make sure the person is wearing a proper harness, that the harness is rated for that person's weight and that is still in its serviceable life. Uh, the hard hat and goggles should be worn by everybody when any type of overhead work is being done, even if you're on the ground. Boots or work shoes to protect your feet. Trust me, that steel shank in your boot will save you from those tower rungs if you've been up there for two hours. They will start eating into your feet. Have enough crew to do the job safely. And another thing that's not posted here, always make sure that somebody else is present if you're climbing a tower. Don't ever try to do it by yourself. You can climb it, but it's not recommended. Safety checklist. Run through a safety checklist before you get started. Inspect all the guying and hardware Crank up towers must be fully nested and blocked. 
you will see that again. The reason for that is if it's not and you're climbing on that tower and it fails, you're talking about it coming down and shearing your fingers and toes clean off. It won't slow down. You're not going to stop it. If you're climbing, make sure the belt is rated for the weight and it's an allowable service line. Check all your ropes and hardware such as D-rings and pulleys. Make sure all the circuits and pa supply power to the tower are locked out and tagged so nobody can energize that, that circuit. Use a gym pole. I don't know how many people have seen a gym pole or used one. It's a temporary mass used to lift materials such as antennas and tower sections so that you don't have to hoist the things directly. It is a lifesaver. Um, basically, it, it bolts up, and there will be a pulley at the top, and you can have someone from the bottom hoist your stuff up for you. And when it hoists it up, it hoists hoist it up above where you need it so you can pull it over and set it in properly. It's a building Legos. Why is it called a gin pole? It's a genie. It's magic. It's really because it was a bunch of guys sitting around over a lot of gin that came up with the idea. <laughs> All right, questions. When should members of a tower team, tower work team wear hard hat and safety glasses? At all times when work is being done on the tower. What is a good precaution to observe before climbing an antenna tower? Carefully inspect the climbing harness. Grounded wrist strap won't do you much good. No. <laughs> Under what circumstance? Hey, well, it depends. If you've got it grounded heavily to the uh, to the tower, then that's constituted as jewelry. And what did I say about jewelry and working? On? <laughs> it could cheer your hand off. Under what circumstances is it safe to climb a tower without a helper or observer? Never. Never. Which of the following is an important safety precaution to observe when putting up an antenna tower? C. C. Look for and stay clear of overhead electrical wires. What is the purpose of a gym pole? To, to lift tower sections or antennas. What is the minimum safe distance from a power line to allow when installing an antenna? D. D. Enough so that if the antenna falls unexpectedly, no part of it can come closer than 10 feet to power lines. Which of the following is an important safety rule to remember when using a crank-up tower? C. C. This type of tower must not be climbed unless re retracted or mechanical safety locking devices have been installed. It will shear your fingers off if it fails. What is considered to be a proper grounding method for a tower? Separate eight foot long ground rods for each tower leg bonded to the tower and to each other. Why should you avoid attaching an antenna to a utility pole? See, the antenna could, con could contact high voltage power wires. <laughs> you're, well, you're, you've turned yourself into a light bulb. Yeah, what? Oh, what is, what is the purpose of a safety wire through a turnbuckle used to tension a guide line? That would be prevent loosening of the guide line from vibration. And that is it. <laughs>